morning. Let's take our song books. We're going to turn to page 12. When he calls, I will fly away. Page 12. We'll ask all those who are able to stand. There was once a time when he to welcome all of you, our Lakeside family, and those that are visiting. Um, I have a few announcements. Uh, please deposit your tithes and offerings in uh, and mission gifts in the metal boxes located in the sanctuary, by the sanctuary doors. We have a new offering that is called the Annie Armstrong Easter offering that we take up every year. You're going to have an envelope that was uh, in the bulletin last week, and it, sh it should be out there in the Welcome Center. And this is being taken up um, before Easter, and all the proceeds, 100% goes toward mission. So please be sure and pray about giving to that. If you are visiting for the first time, and you didn't receive a welcome packet on the way in, please stop by the Welcome Center, fill out a card, and receive a free gift. Also, our Sunday night services, we just want to remind everyone they start at 5 o'clock, and then immediately after that is choir practice. Also, those that are interested, we are going to be ordering some T-shirts, Lakeside T-shirts that have our logos on them. They'll be red with white letters, 
and they'll also have the address and the website and orders are being taken now and there's a sign up sheet and a table set up in the welcome center please stop by there this friday march 2nd at 6 p.m is the vacation bible school workers meeting so if you plan on participating in any way please come to the meeting the easter egg hunt is going to be march 21st at 6 p.m there are empty bags or there are bags of empty eggs at the front doors so please pick up a bag fill them with wrapped candy uh, money etc return the filled bags by march 18th if you are not signed up for one call now please sign up at the welcome center one call now alerts you if there are any church happenings in clement weather where we have closings and so forth so if you have not um done so please stop there and fill that out also if you have not had your picture taken for the church directory please see stacy greg stacy would you mind raising your hand so that they can come see you and um, you'll be included in the electronic version of the directory and then your information will go in the next printed version uh, please pick up a bulletin on the way out for these and other announcements thank you all right, let's turn to page 98, Land Where Living Waters Flow. Let's ask everyone to stand if they're able. Page 98. to see all of you in the house of the Lord, thankful for the privilege that God has given us to assemble together, to worship his name, to glorify him. You see, this is not about us. This is about the Lord. And uh, let me just add something to the announcements that Linda made uh, about the t-shirts. Uh, we're trying to figure out exactly what's going to go on those t-shirts. And one of the things that's been recommended is a picture of the pastor. And we were going to take a vote to see which way that would go, but I just made an administrative decision, and and uh, it's it's not going to go on there. So get a T-shirt. It's good to see you in the house of the Lord. Uh, I would ask who brought the most people with them this morning, but I believe Charles wins. He got a whole row and, and a partial other row of folks back through here.
Thank the Lord for you. Glad you're here. And glad that the rest of you are here this morning. And uh, you just uh, enjoy yourself. I hope and pray that uh, if you don't have a church home and uh, you like what you experience here, that you'll come back. So without anything else being said, let's go to the Lord in prayer. I believe the choir's got a song or two for us. And then Pastor Matt's going to come, our youth pastor, and share with us out of God's Word. Somebody asked me, in fact, they sent me a text this week, and they said, I notice you're not preaching a lot. Are you okay? And I wrote back and said, I'm definitely okay because I'm not preaching a lot. We've got some good young men around here and, and old men too, and uh, I want to give them an opportunity to share with you from God's precious Word. Uh, I'll be preaching tonight, I'll be preaching next week, Lord willing. You know what? We, we talk about next week. We talk about tomorrow. It could very possibly be that we not be here next week. We could all be in heaven next week. You know that? Jesus could come. And if Jesus comes, I hope and pray that you're ready to see him. But you cannot wait till you see him. You have to see him by an eye of faith. And if that's in your heart today, uh, I trust the Lord will nurture that by his Holy Spirit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for this wonderful privilege that is ours to call upon your name and that our prayers would be in the name of Jesus. Lord, you know what we're in need of today. You know every physical need that's represented here. I pray, Father, that you'll touch those needs. I know in Jesus Christ you are our great physician. I read in the scriptures about the healings, Lord Jesus, that you accomplished here on earth, how blind people were made to see, how those that were deaf could hear again, those that couldn't walk had strength given to their legs, and those, our Father, even that were dead, were raised by your power. And you're no less the same God today than you've ever been. And so I pray for every physical need that's here today. May you reach and touch that. And may your hand of healing rest upon them. And I pray also for spiritual needs today. Would there be someone in our midst today without a personal relationship in Christ? I pray, Father, that today would be the day that they would give their heart, their life to Christ. And should there be some here today that are saved, aren't enjoying that salvation, I pray that they would come for a closer walk with you. Take us now in this hour. Bless those that would stand to sing. And I pray your servant as he comes would be strengthened by your spirit. In the name of Jesus, amen.
That bell you just heard is for Children's Church. If you have a child that you'd like to be in Children's Church, you can dismiss them now. We are blessed beyond measure around here with with good men that help me and support me and help this church and support it. And uh, for those of you that may not know, Matt Foley is our youth pastor. He's doing a wonderful job. If you've got kids, uh, this is commercial time. You ever notice some of them preachers on television? They preach about a three-fourths of a message, and then they cut away and give you a commercial, and then they come back. Now, we don't hardly do that during the message around here, but I'll give you a little commercial. If you've got a child, now there's a lot of good churches in this area. If you've got a child, you'll find no better church that will help your child grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ than Lakeside Church. We put a great emphasis on our kids as well as others. So I just encourage you to do that. But I want you to listen very closely as Matt comes and shares with us from God's precious word. morning. It's great to see you all in the house of the Lord. <clears throat> it's good to be here. Amen? Boy, we better warm up better than that. You guys got to help me preach. I'm only as good as the crowd is. Try that again. It's good to be here. Amen? Amen. All right, it's a little better. I feel kind of compelled to, before we dive into this. When a few weeks ago, before I even actually set a date to preach, God put this on my heart, and to be quite honest, I argued quite a bit with them because this is a pretty heavy topic and a topic that I have decent amount of knowledge in, but I said, God, you know, that's, that's a really heavy topic that you're asking me to talk about. And I kind of lost that argument, as you can imagine. And I'd ask that, and I don't ask this because I think I'm anything special, God's the one who's special. And I'd ask if you're in a close relationship with God, pray. Because God knows that I've done the very best that I can to prepare, but I only preach as good as you guys pray. And so I would pray that if you're in the right frame of mind with God, that you'd humble your heart and pray for me. And pray for those who are going to be listening to this message, because once we dive into this, it'll be pretty clear what God is asking of different people for this message. If you would, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter number 20. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 20. And when you have found that, if you would, please stand out of respect for the reading of God's word. Revelation chapter 20. Book of Revelation, as we know, John is on the Isle of Patmos and is given a vision through God to write the words that are inspired out of this book. As we know, if you've been in church any amount of time, the book of Revelation is all about the end of time, as we phrase it. Every prophecy in this book has came true, and this is yet to come. And as we see in Revelation chapter number 20, we're going to look at verses 11 through 15. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man, according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Thank you. you. may be seated. So as I briefly mentioned, John is on the Isle of Patmos. He is given this vision through God of the ends of time. Now, I'm not going to dive into every single portion of this book because there is a vast amount of information that is contained in the book of Revelation about things that are yet to come. I heard an illustration when I was preparing this message of theologians and some of the atheists of the world, of what they thought was the probability of every prophecy in the word of God coming true. 
they said it would be the same as covering this entire globe in two foot of quarters and then anonymously placing one gold coin on that earth buried in those quarters somewhere and then taking a man who has no knowledge of where this coin is at and having him with one grasp reach into those quarters and pull out that gold coin. Yet I find that even though that may sound so unimaginably impossible, this word has never missed a prophecy. There's nothing that has never hit the mark that God has said is going to happen. So if we believe this book cover to cover, then we have to believe that the end of time is coming. And I, of course, am not a prophet. I'm not God. The Bible says no man knoweth the hour of when God is going to come back. But we can see the signs of the times are here. The ends of times are coming. If you read this book, it talks about wars, rumors of wars, and all kinds of horrible things that are going to come about. Well, if you look at the world around us, every day you turn on the news, somebody's talking about either bombing another country or somebody's fighting with somebody else. It's to a T fitting the end of time growing closer and closer and closer. And as I delve into this book of Revelation, I know that there are a few different beliefs of exactly how the end of time is going to happen. And to be quite honest, some of this stuff is confusing even to me, and I've tried to study it out the best that I can. But I found something very interesting. Out of the four different types of beliefs that I saw, I came to this passage. And this passage is called the Great White Throne Judgment. I'm going to delve into that quite a bit this morning. But of those four beliefs, some of the different things that are prophesied to happen, they kind of had different beliefs. Some people believed it has already happened, that we're in it, it's going to happen. They kind of disagreed on a lot of things. But there was one thing that all of them had the exact same thought about, and that was this passage. They all said the exact same thing is going to happen at this time in this passage. And when we come to this passage, this is after all the things have already happened. If earlier in the chapter 20 it says that Satan has been cast in the lake of fire, it's over. But there's another major event that is going to happen. And that's what this passage talks about, and that's the great white throne judgment. Now, if you don't know anything about this judgment, this judgment is not for those who are saved and who are believers. This is the judgment for those who have not placed their faith and trust in God. There will not be a saved person standing before God at this judgment. All of that has already happened. This is coming to the very last moment before God destroys this earth, creates a new heaven, a new earth. So if we see, if we go back, I'm going to use, keep your Bible handy because we're going to refer to this passage quite a bit this morning. But we're going to, we see the description of the throne itself in verse number 11. It says, and I saw a great white throne. So the first thing we see is that this throne is great. This throne is higher and more majestic than any other throne in the entire world. This throne is not like another courtroom that you would see in this country. This throne is the highest of the high. You can't get any higher than this throne. And the man, and we're going to get to it, that sits on this throne is what makes this throne great. We see that the throne is white. It stands for purity. Even within our courts today, the judges who preside over those courts are not perfect. They are simply men who have been tasked a job. And they still make mistakes sometimes. So we have courts of appeals. We have the Supreme Court. We have all other kinds of courts to check, triple check this court and that court. But you know what? There is no triple checking process to this court. What happens at this throne is final. There's no court of appeals. There's no other process that you can go through. It is simply the final phase. There's nowhere else to go from here. And as we continue to read in verse 11, we see it says, In him that sat on it. Well, friend, who is the him? The him is the Holy Son of God. He is going to be the judge, the prosecutor, the jury, and the executioner, all built into one. He is the one who sits above all. My God is still in control, and he is in control of every single part that happens throughout this entire book. You see, prophecy after prophecy, God is in control. Well, friend, he's not going to have somebody else do this final judgment. He, is going to, he has, all throughout this book, sent messengers to do his will. But he's going to stand face to face with those who have not trusted him at this judgment. And as we continue to read in verse 11, you see, From whose face the earth and heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. 
I hear pretty common, I'm sure, as most of you have sometimes, people very jokingly talk about hell. Well, you know, I'm driving the bus to hell. Why don't you jump on with me? Oh, God, he's not, okay. If, if God's, God's listening to me, go ahead, God. Do whatever you want. I've seen people do that. Well, you know what, friend? When it comes to that final throne, there won't be anybody standing in front of God. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 14 that every knee will bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. There's not going to be an unbeliever that is standing before God at that moment. When God comes out of his chambers, if you look at a courtroom today, there's a bailiff that stands by the judge's court, court desk. And when the judge comes out, he says, all rise, judge so-and-so is presiding, and everyone stands out of respect for the judge. There will not need to be an introduction for when God takes the throne. There's not going to need to be somebody to say, hey, who is that man? No, the simple presence and weight of God's name and his holy presence will be more than enough to put every single person on their knee in front of God. And there won't be a person, there won't be an angel that has to go through and say, hey, you have some respect, why don't you get down on your knee? Oh no, friend, I can see the worst atheists in the world bowing their knee before a holy God. And there won't be a person that will be able to stand just from the sheer weight of his presence in the holy courtroom. And I see... As he takes that throne, there's going to be millions upon millions of people standing before God. The Bible talks about the numbers as the sand in the sea. And now we see in verse 12 and 13 the actual trial that is going to take place. If you look at a courtroom today, the prosecution team has what's called the burden of proof when it comes to the case. The defendant has to say absolutely nothing. They're not required by law to say a thing. His defense doesn't even actually have to technically say anything. They usually do, but they don't have to. The prosecutor has to prove what's called beyond a reasonable doubt that that man or that woman is guilty of the crimes they're being accused of. So we see, as I had mentioned, God, there is no... Ah, uh, if I can just sway one juror today that I'm not an unbeliever. If I can just convince one other person that I'm not guilty, I'll be okay. No, friend. God is the one who you would have to convince, which is not going to happen. And we'll get more into that. But we see in verse number 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. In the books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. In verse 13, and the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. So we see God is seated at his throne before these millions and millions of unbelievers. And he talks about the books. Mentions a couple books, and I believe there's going to be three books that are going to be at this final judgment. And I'm going to talk in great detail about all of them. But the first, there's going to be a book of deeds. There's going to be a book, because if you remember in your studies, that when you get saved, the Bible talks about how Jesus washes away all your sins, and they are thrown in the sea of forgetfulness. Amen? And what? You're an unbeliever. God has not done that for you. God has not cleaned anything because you haven't asked him to. So we see a book that's full of things that we have done. One of the key things that I think will be in that book is all the times that you rejected God. All the times like this. You were preached the word. God spoke to your heart and you rejected it. And there's going to be another book says the book of life, also referred to as the Lamb's book of life somewhere, sometimes. This is the book where God has written all those who have trusted him. He has written their name down. And when I thought about that, I said, you know, God knows everything. Why would God need a book to write down something that I know he knows? God knows everything. Why would he have to write it down? Well, friend, I thought, well, he's got to prove it to, he's got to prove his case, right? Well, we're very visual people. We have very closed minds. We're not perfect. We don't know everything. 
So when it comes to that day, you're not going to have an argument of, well, God, how can you prove that my name's written in there because I don't see it? Well, friend, I don't either. And he's going to have the physical proof to show you that your name's not written down. And the third thing I believe that's going to be there is the Bible. The Bible says that he is the word. He is the bread of life. So I would say that God is going to have his word as a part of the testimony against us. And I can see as he takes that word, and if this word were a physical person, and that defendant is now standing before God. He has called his first defendant to start his trial. In the prosecution, if you've ever been in a court, they go first. They get the chance to prove their case first, and the defense can then choose whether they wish to say anything. So I can see, as God calls his first witness, Mr. John 3.16, will you come take the stand? Mr. John 3.16, have you ever met this man? Why, yes, Lord, I have. I've met him on many occasions. I've met him during Sunday school. I've met him during sermons. I've met him throughout the week. God, I've met this man many times. Well, friend, what did you tell Mr. Defendant here? Well, God, I told him, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God, I told him how you left your throne above and took the form of a baby in a manger and how after you grew up, you went to a cross to die for me. You shed your blood. You were spit upon. You were scourged. You had a crown of thorns beaten into your head all because you loved us. God, you didn't have to do that for us. God had zero obligation to save us. We were the ones who chose sin. Adam and Eve chose sin in the garden. God, I told them how even though it was your choice, you sent the one thing that is most precious to you as a, as a father is you sent your son for us. I told him, God, thank you, Mr. John 316, why don't you have a seat? I can see as he calls another. Mr. Romans 323, why don't you come up here and testify? Mr. Romans 323, what did you tell this man? I told him, God, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. God, I told him that since Adam and Eve, every single one of us down to the very last child that's ever born into this world, we're all sinners. We've all come short. When you see of that short of the glory, God is the only one who is perfect. There's nobody else who has ever been perfect in this world except him. So we fall short because if we were perfect, there would be no need for God to have died on the cross. It wouldn't be needed because we would just take ourselves there if we were perfect. We have no way to get there other than him. I told him, Lord, I told him so many times. Thank you, sir. Why don't you have a seat? Mr. Romans 6, 23, why don't you come up here and tell him what you told him. I told him, God, for the wages of sin is death. I told him, God, that you deserve to die and go to hell because of your sins. There's not a perfect one in here. We all deserve it. From the pulpit down to the pew, we all deserve to go to hell. But the best rest, rest of that verse is the best part. But the gift of God is eternal life. God gave you eternal life. He died. Think about that, folks. He physically died for you. I love each and every one of you. But if you said, Matt, you can save every single person in this room, but you have to die, I don't think I could do it. For my family, I probably could. But he did that for millions and millions and billions of people who he's never met. He did that for us. He did that for you. And I can see another. It says, Mr. Romans 5, 8, why don't you come up here and tell this man what he was told? He said, but God commendeth his love towards us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He freely gave it to us, Lord. I told him, you want to see the list, God? I even kept a list. These are all the times that he was preached and he said, I'm rejecting it. Because folks, one thing people don't think about is they say, how can God send somebody to hell? He doesn't send anybody to hell. If you choose to go to hell, you take a step and you trample over every single thing that God ever did for you to get to hell. 
Just like it's a decision to go to heaven, it's a decision to go to hell. And if you take that step over everything that God has done for you and you say, you know what, God, I don't need any of this, then guess what? You've made your choice. You have made your bed, and now this is the judgment where it's coming forth. Now comes the day when, you know what, you have to give an account for what you have done with God. You have to give an account for all the times that you rejected God. And I can see the last. He says, I've got one more witness. Why don't you come stand up here, Mr. Romans 10, 13. Why don't you come stand up here and tell us what you told him? And I told him, Lord, that for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God, I told him that that's free to anybody. It doesn't say I might think about it. Maybe if you're a good enough person, I might do it. No, it says anybody who calls can receive it. And I can see this defendant standing before God, shaking to the core. I can see the look on his face. Oh, God, what have I done? And I can just see all these times just replaying in his head. God, what did I do? What have I done? So now he comes to the next book. And he says, child, this is my book of life. This is where I write all the people who place their faith and trust in me. This is where I put their name because they're very special to me. They got a special place in my heart. And son, I have looked from cover to cover through this book. And I'll even let you look through it. Your name's not in here. Your name has not been written in my blood because you rejected me. Because you didn't give of yourself to me like I gave myself to you. You're not written in this book. And now he comes to that last book that I talked about, and he comes to the book of deeds. And he says, child, on February 25th, 2018, you rejected me. On such and such date, you rejected me. Child, I knocked on the door of your heart over and over and over and over, and you rejected me. Why? It was free. If I told you that I had the cure to the worst disease in the world, you'd come find me. You would seek me out. You'd give every dime in your bank account to come find me if you had that disease. Well, friend, you've got a disease. And it's free. This is the best gift you can ever receive. It doesn't cost you a thing. It's free. And God gave it to you. But now we're here. And it's too late. A defendant, when he stands before the judge, can't, go, can't roll back time and change what happened. That defendant that stands before the judge and begs for his life can say, I'm sorry. But he can't change what's already happened. He can't change the times. So I see, out of those millions of people, there's a few different types of defendants that will be standing here. And I can see... God has finished his testimony. And he says, Son, what do you have to say for yourself? And I can see a section of defendants. These are the scoffers. These are the atheists, the evolutionists, those who have committed their life to wreck the name of God. But God, I had had a bad home life. But God, that's the way I was taught. But God, I, I didn't know. You're an evolutionist, right? Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth his handiwork. The things you studied showed you I am a God. Showed you that I am in control. Showed you that I exist. And you rejected him. I can see another type. These are the self-righteous people. These are the moral, the good people. They come before God. But God, I gave to the poor. But God, I was a good person. But God, I I never got in any big trouble. You know, maybe I made some mistakes, but God, I wasn't that bad of a person. But God, you could see my life. Go go ask my mom. Go ask my dad. You know, I'm I'm a decent person. None of these excuses will hold their weight in water when it comes to this judgment. Because you can say anything you want to say, but there's one question, and God's already proved you wrong. Did you accept me? 
He's not asking you what you do. Friend, there's a lot of good people in this world, if you want to phrase it that way. But there's a lot of good people going to hell. Because good things does not automatically equate to salvation. You can't earn your way there. If God wanted you to earn your way there, there'd be step by step. You do this step, and this gets you one step closer to me. And then you do this step, and, this get, and there would be a pattern for us to follow if it was good works that would get us to heaven. But it's not. And I see a third crowd. And these people trouble me so bad. These are the someday crowd. S-O-M-E, the someday crowd. And I see as they come before God, and they know where they are. They don't have a question like maybe some of these other people. I don't really know where I am, but I know, I know this is God. Oh, no, they know what's going on. God, you knew I was going to get saved. But God, I just wasn't ready yet. But God, I just hadn't gotten cleaned up enough yet. Friend, you don't get cleaned up to get saved. You get saved to get cleaned up. God didn't ask you to get cleaned up before he gives you something. No, he said, come unto me as you are. God doesn't ask you to change yourself before you come to him. And if you, you can't get saved on your time, you got to get saved on God's time. Because today, I may not even finish this message before God comes back. And if I was sitting in this crowd, I wouldn't even wait till I got done. Because God might crack the eastern sky while I'm preaching and come back. And you know what? You'll be the only one left sitting here because I'm leaving. I am not staying. God says that there's a rapture coming and I'm going with him. And he says, I'm not sending another angel. I'm not sending another messenger. No, I'm coming because that's my bride. That's the ones I've paid for with my blood. And I'm coming for them myself. And we're leaving. You can't wait. You can't wait. You don't get saved when you're ready to get saved. God's knocking on your heart because he says, you're ready. Listen to me. Because the day is coming when this is going to happen. Remember that little story I told at the beginning? Every prophecy has been fulfilled. And this is yet to come. If God hasn't missed his mark yet, he's not going to miss it now. He hasn't missed it yet. He won't miss it now. And you think, oh, you know, but people, I, <laughs> I love this story. There was an astronaut that went up into space a few years ago and said, I got up there and I couldn't find God. Well, you know what? I loved one of the Facebook comments that said, son, take your mask off. You'll meet him real quick. You know what, friend? God is real. Just because you can't see him doesn't mean he's real. And when you do see him, it's too late. Because there won't be. Like I said, there won't be an unbeliever that's in that crowd. Every single person in that crowd is going to believe in God. Every single person is going to th- say, that is God. But it's too late. And I can see one last crowd. Maybe they're over in the corner by themselves. And they're just shaken to the core. Because they not only know what's going on, yet they're so confused. And this, friend, is the Sunday crowd. This is the Sunday crowd. And I can see as they come before God. God, I went to church. God, I gave tithes and offerings. God, I helped out with the nursery. God, I sang in the choir. God, I was faithful to church. I went out and helped the homeless. I even sometimes told people I went to church. God, why am I here? Friend, faith without works is dead. And faith with works is dead is dead. You can come to church and warm that pew up every Sunday and you're no closer to heaven. Listen to me very closely. I very strongly believe in the Baptist religion. I wouldn't be a Baptist preacher if I didn't. But religion will send you to hell. Religion by itself will send you to hell quicker than you can think about it. You say, preacher, I come to church. That doesn't get you there. Preacher, I give of my earnings as God tells me to. And you ain't got no Bible to back that. I'm glad you asked. Let's turn to Matthew chapter number 7. Matthew chapter number 7. I want you to see this. Matthew 7. Jesus is out ministering. and He's preaching. And we come to verse 21 as he's talking to some of the religious higher up people of the day. And he says, in verse 21, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, 
which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I, speaking of God, will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Friend, that's talking about the Sunday crowd. Coming to church will not get you there. And you say, preacher, I've done so many wrong things. God will never take me. Remember the story. God is being crucified on the cross. And there was two thieves on each side of him. And if I remember that story correctly, there's a thief that got told, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Friend, you haven't done anything wrong enough and bad enough that God can't clean it up. God created everything, so how could he not clean it up? And you say, I, I don't even know where to start. Well, you got to start somewhere. And you got to start here. Because, friend, this day is coming. The judgment of God will happen. So let's say you've heard all of this, and you say, you know what, God, I don't buy it. I don't buy that for a dollar. I am not going to believe this. Well, let's go back to Revelation, and let's see what happens. So we read in Revelation 11, verse 14 and 15, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I've read that passage many, many times, having grown up in church. I've heard messages like this repeated over and over, and I never thought of this till now. It says, and they are cast in the lake of fire. And I can see the judgment is over. And he looks at that defendant and says, depart from me, I never knew you. And I can see as that defendant stands before God, and here comes a couple angels as they come and grab a hold of him. And now we're going towards the gates of hell. I don't think, like the people joke today, all right, here we go. We're just going to go ahead and march right in. Let's get this party started. No, I can see as they're clawing and scratching and kicking and begging God for mercy. But God, I didn't know. God, give me mercy. As they're just dragging him towards the gates of hell. And it's not going to be, I'm just going to walk right on in here. No, you're going to be thrown in. Because there's not a person standing here who's going to say, God, I want to go there. Because it's going to be real. Folks, hell is real. This is real. This will happen. And if you say, God, I don't buy it. Then friend, this is your destiny. This will be how it ends for you. And if you read that, verse 14 it says this is the second death. You've already died physically. And now you're going to die physically and spiritually for all of eternity. Think about that. The average life expectancy is 72 years old nowadays. 72 years out of eternity that you're going to spend in hell. Eternity. Grasp, try to grasp your mind around that. Have you ever been burnt? Imagine that. For all of eternity. That never stopping. And I can imagine, just like the rich man and Lazarus, when you get down there, you'd do anything to get out of there. You'd do anything to just get a little bit of relief. And if you recall that story, the rich man looked up at Lazarus, and correction, looked up at Abraham and said, Send Lazarus, that he may dip his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in torment in this flame. Friend, it's real. If you do not know where you're going, friend, this is what's going to happen. And when it's going to happen, I don't know. And you say, well, preacher, you're not a prophet. You can't prophesy to when that's going to happen. You're right. I can't. Wouldn't even begin to try. But neither can you. You can't tell when this day is coming. I remember a church that I went to when I was just out of high school. We were having revival, and this man that we went to church with ran a lawn cutting service. And in the summertime, he would usually hire teenagers from the church to help him, let them make some money. 
he had two 18-year-olds and a 17-year-old with him. And they said, you know what, we're going to cut... We're going to quit cutting grass early for a day, and we're going to go to revival. And the one young man whose name was Michael was 17 years old and got saved that night at revival. And when they left, they packed up in their work truck, and we're going to go out and finish some more jobs before the daylight was gone. And while they were driving to the next job, a semi crossed the center line and killed them all. All died on the scene. Friend, that 17-year-old took the last chance he ever had. And I'm very thankful he did. I know his family. And they were so thankful. He was on his way home to tell mom and dad, I got saved. And he never got to make it. But as sure as I'm standing here, if what I saw was real and I know it was, that man's in heaven. But you know what? You don't know when your last time is. You don't know when your last chance for God knocking on your heart is. You don't know when it is. I don't know when it is. So don't waste any time. Don't waste time. For what? What, what are my friends going to say? I've gone to church here for 10 years. What are these people going to think of me? I'll tell you what they'll think of me because the same exact thing happened to me. I was in church Passing out gospel tracts on a Wednesday afternoon as a teenage boy, telling other people about Jesus, and I didn't have him myself. And you know what happened when I got saved? Everybody was happy. There wasn't anybody that's like, look at this hypocrite. Look at this guy. He just wants some attention. You know what? I was braced in love, not only from the Father, but from those around me. Amen. And friend, that's all that's going to happen. There's nobody here who's going to look at you and say, Really? No! Because we know this is coming. We know this is going to happen. And God saved you from all of this. It's one simple thing God asked of you to do. Marty, Tom, if you'd come, please. There's one simple thing God asked of you. And that is this. Just come to him. That's all he asked of you. It's free. He didn't ask you to do anything for it. Well, preacher, I'm not perfect. Just because I stand behind a pulpit doesn't make me perfect. I'm far from it. We all are. That's why God sent his son, who was perfect, to die on the cross for you. That way, you didn't have to try to make amends for your own sin. That you never could. Because you could try and try and try, and you'll never make amends for your own sin. Now, friend, I didn't tell you all of that to try to just be big and scary and make things up. Friend, I don't make things up. God's the one who told us this is what's going to happen. And it's all avoidable with one simple thing. But, But preacher, I don't know what to do. Well, friend, I serve the master who always listens. I serve the master who's got all the answers. And you can't find the answer till you come look for it. And you just say, God, I'm sorry. If you would, please bow your heads. Everyone, nobody looking around, please. Search your heart, friend. If you say, preacher, I don't know where I'm going when I die. I think I have a good idea now, but I want to change that. Friend, if you cannot go back to a place and a time, maybe you don't know the date, but you can't go back to a place and time when God reached way down and got a hold of you, then friend, this this message is for you. You can't change the outcome of the end of times. God has already set that. But you can change it, your destiny, starting today. And friend, maybe, you know, you say, preacher, I've, I've been saved, but you know what? I'm really not ready to meet God either. You know, I'm saved. I won't be standing before this judgment. But you know what? I'm really not ready to stand before God. Then friend, Today is the day to make it right. Don't waste time. Don't let Satan confuse you. Don't let Satan tell you a lie that it's going to be all right. Because it's not. Come find the master today. You may lift your heads. If all of you would stand, please, if this message has gone out to you, don't waste time. Don't wait till he starts singing. Don't wait till I get done talking. You come. God has sent this. Like I said, this was not something that I was very comfortable with talking about. But you know what? God sent it this way for somebody. 
Don't make it waste. God sent this message to somebody's heart, and he's telling you right now, friend, this is for you. Friend, I'm knocking on the door of your heart. This is for you. As these men begin to sing, please come. Don't waste any time. Careless soul, why will you linger wandering from the fold of night? Hear you not the invitation. Now, there's something else that I forgot to mention. You also read in the book of Revelation a very unique verse that I love that says, God is not the author of confusion. Right now, if this message went out to you, the devil's given it everything he's got to give you every excuse imaginable of why you don't need to come up here. Well, you're going to be embarrassed. What are those people going to think of you? What, what are they going to do? I tell you what we're going to do because I'll do it myself because I'm standing down here waiting for you. He's waiting with open arms. I can't save you. I can't get you there. If I could, you bet that I would do it for every single person I knew because hell is real and this is real and I don't want anybody to go there. I don't want a single soul to have to go there. But that's a choice that you have to make. Don't listen to the lies. This day and age, we are lied to so much. On a daily basis, there's something that's always deceiving and a trick. There's no trick about this. This isn't strings attached. This isn't the phone call that says you've won a free cruise, but you've got to give me five grand. And it's really not free. There is no strings attached. This is free. It's a free gift from God Almighty Himself. The one who gave you breath to breathe. You're only standing here because of God. Think about that. Nobody here would be alive if it wasn't for God himself giving you the breath to breathe. As they continue to sing, please come. While so thoughtless are ye standing, while the fleeting years go by, and your life is spent in folly. Oh, prepare to meet the God. Hairless soul, oh, meet thy warning. For your life is soon be gone. Oh, how sad. Folks are still praying. Can I ask you something? I get real emotional when I think about the days that this happened to me. I was only 14 
Remember, it is clear as the day I'm alive. And if you have no joy and you say, you know what, I, really, I can't find a day like that. And friend, this day can be yours. You can claim it as your own. God has given it to you if you'll take it. All throughout the message, the message on judgment, can I remind you of a verse? The Bible says that judgment begins at the house of God. So you don't have to wait way out yonder because what this judgment he's preached about is a declaration of the judgment that God brings to every heart that rejects him even now. And the one thing about salvation, America's pastor passed this week. You all have heard of Billy Graham went home to be with Jesus. And I heard a man interview another man who had interviewed Billy Graham. And he said, what stands out to you about this man of God? And he said, the simplicity of the gospel that he preached. It wasn't entangled in what man can do, but just a very simple message. For God so loved us all that he gave that's really the message of the Bible. God's agape love prompted him to give. And all God is asking of you, if I gave my life for you, I'm asking you to give your life to me. That's all salvation is. Could I ask you to do this before we come to this mission? And I appreciate those that have come, come to rededicate the life. Could I just ask you one more time to bow your heads? But Pastor Matt and I, and the good Lord, are the only ones looking on. Could we have the privilege of praying for you throughout this week? If you're here today and you've never committed your heart to Christ, and you would simply say by a simple, simple gesture, I won't ask you to raise your hand. Others may hear it go up. But if you'll just lift your head and your eyes capture ours, and by that simple gesture you say, pray for me. This message has come to my heart. I need to do something with Jesus. Would you do that this morning? You just look my direction. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Others, others, give us a moment just to look across the crowd. God bless you. Anyone else? Thank you. You may lift your heads. I say this to you every time I ask you to do what I just did. That's a good start. But even that can't get you to heaven because you're looking to me. You're looking to Pastor Matt. We can't get you there. But if you'll take your gaze and direct it to him, we serve a God that loves us beyond measure. But he also, because of his righteousness, he told you that that throne was white because of the righteousness of God. And his righteousness will not allow him to hear you say, but I was a good person. Wipe my slate clean. The only way your slate gets wiped clean is by the blood of the Lamb. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Thank God for this message. Thank God that it rings in hearts. Let me invite you back, particularly if you're a person who acknowledged your need. Come back. Put yourself under the teaching and the preaching of God's Word. And when you do that, you just trust the Holy Spirit. He'll speak. And when He speaks, now's the time to respond. Thank you for being here today. We love you. We appreciate you. If we could do anything to minister to you, uh, we'd be honored to do so.
May you keep that in mind. If you want to sign up for a T-shirt, that's out this door. If you're visiting, you didn't fill out a visitor card, uh, we don't hound you around here. Uh, what I would like to do is to send you a little note and tell you glad you were here and communicate with you and uh, give you my address just in case you want to take me to lunch one Sunday after church. God bless you. You're at liberty to go. I was listening to him. I'm like, I'm glad I'm in the these are they crowd. <laughs> <laughs>